This is the Gunsmith Show. I'm John. And I'm Jake. And we are here to talk about uh, a subject that's near and dear. You know, I've always felt myself to be a rifleman. As much as I talk about pistols, there's something about grabbing a rifle and getting out to the range. Yep. And I absolutely love to hunt. I, I love to target shoot. And, I, you know, people ask me, don't you ever get tired of shooting? It's like, why why would I get tired of shooting? This is what I like to do. I, I get, Yeah, you get out to the range, you might get tired of pulling the trigger. Like saying, but, do you ever get tired of the sunshine? Do you yeah. ever get tired of waking up? <laughs> no, no, I, I really don't. Uh, so before we get too far into the subject, though, yes. Uh, before we start into the subject, I want to talk about how you can contact us if you need to. Okay. Uh, first way, you can go to Facebook and find us there. It's our name on there. Is the four words the Gunsmiths Show? That's right. Like us and tell your friends about us. That's right. Get and more people on there. We share pictures. I was very happy this week because. Our pictures tended to spread like wildfire today, this week. <laughs> That's good. Uh, also, we have our website where you can always see our Guns of the Week, plus links to all of our great sponsors. Our website is the GSS.com. Good. I really want to thank our sponsors, uh, especially Williams Gun Site, Duraguard Roofing, Tim Cassidy, Attorney at Law, Pal yep. Alarm, and uh, um, Zach Goodhart. That's right. Uh, Farm Bureau Insurance. Now, so, I uh, really, really wouldn't be here without them. If you have a question that you don't want to put on Facebook for everybody to see, right? there's two ways. You can email us, shooter at the gss.com. comes right to my phone. Or you can always send us a letter in the mail. Sure. The Gunsmith Show. P.O. Box 45. Yep. Flushing, Michigan, 48433. Excellent. Those are the best ways to contact us. The only ways to contact us. That's well, why they're the best. I, I'm going to give you an option. October 26th, you know what you can do? October 26th, you can come and see us at the Davison Gun Show at the Knights of Columbus Hall in Davison, Michigan. We're going to be set up there with a table. We'll be meeting and greeting, but we'll also have some of our stuff for sale. So you can stop by and see us at the Davison Gun Show. Can own October a gun 26th. that was used on the Gunsmith Show. That's right. Once we talk about <laughs> We're going to let a few fly. We're going to let some go. That's right. Well, it's like a good We're not bird. giving them away, but they'll be for sold it, at a fair price. It's like an animal. You've raised from its beginning, and now you've raised up to be an adult and let it go off with somebody else. Kind of only different. Okay. All right. So let's talk about Colonel Jeff Cooper. That's the late right. Colonel Jeff Cooper. Now, if you've ever been, and if you're, new to the, if you're new to the sport, if you're new to shooting and hunting, work with me a little bit here. Now, what we're going to talk about is Colonel Cooper. Jeff Cooper has always been one of those outspoken gun guys that told kind of shout kind of like the John Wayne of the gun industry. Yeah. Okay. He was kind of the Duke of, of our gun industry. What he would do, he started a ranch called the Gun Sight Sight Ranch. The Gun Sight Ranch was designed to teach people how to shoot for defense and basically learn your rifleman skills. Right. And your, and your handgun skills. And your handgun, you know, was designed to get you time to get to your long gun. Back then, you know, your semi-auto handgun when he started this was the 1911. 1911 is what he always carried. Now, what they talk about and what he, he impressed on people heavily was, you remember that, your, your handgun is to get you to your long gun. Right. You can carry your handgun on you, but you can't always carry your long gun on you. Police officers in this situation have their handgun on their hip, but their long guns are either in the trunk of their car or in the front seat, their shotgun, or their rifle. So to get to the, to get to the point, they have to defend themselves with their short guns, with their handguns, to get to the long guns. That's what Gunsight Ranch was built for, so that you could have close combat, you could work around um, uh, barricades, doorways, going into rooms, and just honing your shooting skills and he was professional at it. So imagine if that was your business. Well, that's where his knowledge came from, from years and years of this. So known as Colonel Cooper. Jacob, tell us more about him. Well, 48 years ago, uh, this month's Guns and Ammo magazine, he decided to talk about the carbine rifle. So our show today is about a Guns and Ammo magazine from 1966. It's about an article he posted in there and how it's kind of still relevant today. Most of what he says is pretty relevant today. So let's hear about it. Well, the first thing he says is that we're all wrong. 
<laughs> we're saying we're saying carbine wrong. Are we? It's carbine. Carbine. He said it should rhyme with bar wine, not far seen. Oh no, kidding. So it's carbine. Carbine. Got me carbine. Yeah. Okay. Good. We know that now. Uh, it's not carbine and it's not carbon. It's carbine. Very good. So the whole essence of the carbine is to be handy rifle. Generally, they start as a rifle and then are reduced both by length and weight. Okay, uh, so uh, as a full-size rifle, then they make it smaller to make it yes. carbine. Carbine. Okay. Now, he did mention that in some t- cases, it is a handgun that is increased in size. Yeah, I to can make see it. that. But generally, they are rifles shortened and lightened up. Okay. But it does, does not, not make sense to use a handgun and make it larger. Sure. But then you get into problems where are you making a rifle out of a handgun right so or, or making a handgun out of a rifle exactly. which is illegal and in the days when he p- probably first started experimenting with these rifles there was no problems no it's before 1968 there rifles. was no problem when you cut off a barrel to whatever to make it work okay so we're going to talk about carbines that's right so now his idea carbine rifle needs to be less than seven pounds Makes sense. A short action. I bet you he actually hated uh, M1As. Probably. You know, even in, you know, as a tank of a rifle, but as a handy rifle, no, no. I, you know, you're talking a nine pound rifle. That's a big difference. Well, so he, it needs to be less than seven pounds, and he asks that it be a short action. That's right. That makes a lot of sense. Too. So it's a shorter, shorter caliber. Um, has to wants it to be capable of taking a thousand pound animal okay and able to hit with iron sights out to 450 meters and he said this in 1968 66 66 i'm it, sorry he he said a human sized target at 450 meters okay okay interesting yep now there when the rifle becomes shorter and lighter though there are many advantages but with every advantage there are also some disadvantages and that's what he kind of wanted to cover is about don't think this rifle is going to be perfect because there are some things you have to realize that are going to happen when you go to a shorter carbine you're, style yeah, rifle. Yeah, you're going to trade off right the advantages of the shorter gun for the kind of the disadvantages, disadvantages. of what happens when you cut that barrel down. But you want to weigh out right. Yeah, what those disadvantages. You know, we'll see how it goes here. So the first thing he talked about is loss of some ballistical powder. Power. Okay. Ballistical power. Ballistical power. You like that? Sounds like a mystical power. That's right. Well, it's basically because the shorter barrel allows for less pressure to build up as the round is leaving the barrel. As, as the projectile leaves the barrel, it'll be going a little bit slower because it hasn't built up quite as much pressure. Right. Very good. Now, this was in 1966. Yes. I feel that since then, our hand-loading techniques, along with some of the new powders and the sure. new bullet technologies, if you're still using this, the, the same powder from years ago, but right. some of the new stuff, superformance and everything, I think some of this is intended for, or for instance, AR-15s. Sure, it's intended out of a 16-inch barrel. Now, yeah, now they're built for a 16-inch right. barrel instead of 20. 20s, or or back then maybe a 24 that they cut down to a 16. Could have been, yeah, and um. even then, a lot of our ballistic charts will say that it was fired from a 24-inch barrel. Right. You know, and very few of us have, you know, unless you're talking high-power rifles, 24-inch barrels. Now, number two in his list, uh, the recoil will increase. Yes. Usually you get more muzzle this, lift, This has not noise. changed. <laughs> no, it hasn't changed much. But I think the newer guns are well-designed. i well, got to say. Muzzle brakes are very popular now. They I, are almost become widespread use. i got a videotape of you shooting an AR-10. And that gun is designed so well, there's no muzzle lift when you pull the trigger on that gun. Right. Direct blowback, but no muzzle lift. Well, one of the reasons, though, that your let's say your bolt-action rifle will have an increased recoil, because your carbine rifle will be lighter than a standard rifle. Sure will, yep. Uh, he's in, in, so it might be the same recoil as your rifle did in a longer stage. But the gun is lighter, so you feel it tremendously more. Right. The felt pressure on your shoulder will be yes. higher. All right. Number three, some accuracy loss will happen. Uh, it's not an always statement, though. But when you just cut off a barrel, that rifling is intended for a certain spin of the bullet. Yeah. And, 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 you, and you, you tend act, to... 
you might not get as prevailing of accuracy with a shorter barrel right. that as you do with a longer barrel. Well, for okay, a one in one in twenty, one in twenty-two twist. Yes. On some of these other larger calibers. Right. If the barrel's only sixteen and a half inches long. Yeah, but you're getting the spin. You're still getting the spin. You just might not get the the pressure and the length of the barrel, the sight radius. Right. All these things add up to not quite being with the iron sights, which Colonel Cooper was that strong was on. Has to have a, a gun without iron sights. He didn't care for them much. Well, that was one of the other reasons why he he kind of talked about accuracy loss because the the rifles that were considered carbines back then. Yes. The sights were not as fine as standard sights. They didn't have Williams fire sights back then. Right. They right. did have some of the Williams peep sights. Yes, they did. A lot but, of them were popular. Uh, and there, he said it was kind of a combination of a lot of things that made the recoil different. And the accuracy loss was because of the recoil. The recoil was more so an inexperienced shooter would almost be somewhat scared to pull the trigger. Mm. And so when you start to shake... You lose accuracy. Sure, sure. Uh, when you, when you're not sure what's going to happen, you pull that trigger. You lose accuracy. You got to be confident. You got to practice. Yes. Now he did discuss uh, the differences between what we call one minute accuracy and two minute accuracy. So this is a direct quote from him. All right. So let's wait. Let's let's talk about that. Let's make it very clear so our listeners know what we're saying. Uh, accuracy, and you called it what? One minute and two minute. So this is that. One MOA and two MOA. Very good. This is very important because this is a very frequently asked question. Yes. Okay. The difference between one minute accuracy and two minute accuracy is the difference between heaven and hell to the purest. But I sometimes wonder if it matters much in a weapon intended for general use in the field. So this is a direct quote from Cooper. Yes. A one minute weapon will strike within one inch of its point of aim at 200 yards. That is inaccurate. That's a sniper rifle, That's, yes. basically. While a two-minute right weapon will strike within two inches of its target at 200 yards. And that's still a sniper rifle. <laughs> now, you can't see that increment with anything but a high-power telescope, and you couldn't hold that close if you could see it. In a field position. From any field position. Yeah. That would be... Uh that would be indiscernible to the to the eye unless you're working with a you know forty power scope to see it two hundred yep. yards. Yep. Now that was that was basically his explanation. Uh, he he kind of went on to say that it's not a matter of the carbine style rifle, mm -hmm. but it's a matter of which carbine you decide to go with. Interesting. So what he did was he picked six guns. Six guns that were fit into his criteria that had... Guns from that era. Exactly. Now, in 1966, on the shelf... What was available? Three, and they had three things in common. Lightweight, short barrels, and iron sights. Well, on that note, let's go to commercial break. Yep, and we're going to talk about these six guns when we come back. All right, hang on tight. The gunsmiths will be right back. You know his limitations. You just can't spend a whole day at the gun store anymore. Thankfully, the crew at Williams Gunsight Company has created the best way to spend the day at the gun store by doing it online. WilliamsGunsight.com is the way to shop for your used handguns, rifles, shotguns, and more with thousands of guns in stock for your total gun shopping experience. Check out WilliamsGunsight.com and find your perfect match today. Attorney Timothy J. Cassidy is the pro-gun attorney that we here at the Gunsmith Show use. With more than 20 years of experience as a prosecuting attorney, law professor, and holding a past seat on the Genesee County Gun Board, Tim Cassidy is your pro-gun attorney. Contact Attorney Cassidy today at 810-569-5441 or email him at attorneycassidy at gmail.com. If you want your home to feel sound when you are not around, call Pal Alarm. To protect your safe keepings and stop anyone from peeking, call Pal Alarm. When the house gets locked down so you can get out of town, call Pal Alarm. Give Pal Alarm a call today at 810-908-8298. That's 810-908-8298 or palalarm.com. And now back to the Gunsmith Show with John and Jake Smith. All 
right, we are back. Now, on today's show, folks, this is the Gunsmiths. I'm John. I'm Jake. And we are talking about carbine rifles. Carbines. It's carbine, not carbine. Carbines. And uh, Jacob has been, and he always, he's my research guy, so uh, That's right. I, I go from... They don't call me the man for nothing. <laughs> Is that a capital T on the? <laughs> so, anyways, we've got um, a good talk today going on the carbine rifles, right. and we're discussing what was actually in 1966. Yep, when in Guns uh, and Ammo magazine by Colonel Cooper, by right. Colonel Jeff Cooper in his writings. Now he selected six different rifles that were available on the shelf in October of 1966. Uh, they all had to share three main points. Interest, yeah. Interest. They had to all have be lightweight have a short barrel, and iron sights. Interesting. So the six guns he picked, uh, first one was the Model 94 Winchester in 30-30. Sure. Lightweight, short barrel, Easy. classic iron sights. Easy gun to carry. If you've ever carried a Winchester 30-30, they're so narrow. They are. They're, they're, they're very almost, handy rifles. They're so thin at the main grip compared to... Others. Other rifles, yeah. They don't have that full body wood stock covering the whole gun. They have a fore end and they have a butt stock. Yep. So lightweight, easy to shoot, a lot of fun. Uh, and and it's what most of us in Michigan, if you're a rifleman, a lot of times that's what you grew up shooting. Yep. Number two is the uh, 6.5 Manlicker Schnauer. Schonauer. Schonauer. Now, the, in, the 6.5 Manlickers are good guns. And they are, they were the basis for a lot of sporterized guns. Now, remember, in this era, the guns that were available in the 60s right. were, like Williams Gunsight, those guys were constantly customizing these guns. Exactly. Shortening them even more. And uh, But let's, let's okay, I, I, I get the hint. We got to get back to the list here. All right, number three was the 30 carbine, Ugh. the U.S. carbine 30 M- uh, M1. Number four was the Ruger 44 carbine. Yeah. Five was the Colt AR-15. All right. Which I'm sure he was probably ridiculed back then for even including that in this list. Yeah, but it meets the criteria. It, it meets Iron the criteria. sights and short and light. Uh, number six was the Remington Model 600 and 308. All right. Now that's now, quite a list. And they are all still available. They you are. know what I mean? None of these are gone now. Well. 60, 48 years later. There, some of them might it's be hard to, to find. find. The 44 carbine, but everything else. And the 308, they still make short ones. Sure. Um, okay, so the first one, the 94 Winchester. Yes. It can work on a deer at 100 yards. Yep. Doesn't have much recoil. Easy to carry, like you said. Yes. And is safe to use. Yeah, it's a learn. It's a shooting system you need to learn to use. Half cock for safety. Uh, you got to pull the. You know, you got to have the lever tight when you pull the trigger. Yep. So, good gun, and, and surprisingly very effective on deer, but it's a thirty caliber gun. Right. It's an original military weapon, so, I mean, they, they work. Well, his uh, his model weighed 6 pounds, 11 ounces, so it was less than 7 pounds. Yep. 38 inches long. Yep. And held seven, 6 plus 1 rounds. 7 rounds. Yeah, there's been some... Uh, there's some, been some discussion in my family about how many rounds you can fit into a 30-30. <laughs> my brother Dan swears you can put 8 rounds into one, but... Uh, and uh, one time he shot his car by accident because of that, but we won't go there. So anyways, <laughs> uh, it did happen. Well, with, <laughs> with open sights, he managed three and a half inch groups at 100 yards. Which is, which is, I would say, a common group for a 30-30. Yep. You know, That's pretty good for open sights yeah. at 100 yards with a lever action. I, I was always told, I grew up with a family that if you could hit a paper plate at 100 yards with iron sights, you're doing good. Yep. That's an accurate. How big were those paper plates? They weren't the little ones. <laughs> <laughs> eight and a half inch paper plates or eight inch paper plates. All right. But, so you know, just keep them grouped. So the Manlicker 6.5 carbine. Yes. Fairly close, actually, to the same age as the Winchester. They're two of the oldest ones in the in the group. Yes. Uh, it had a 20 inch barrel. Yes. A folding rear leaf sight. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a little heavier. It's seven pounds, four ounces. Still not bad, though. Nope. You it's, could lighten this gun up. You could. You, and Very it, easily, you could lighten this gun up. It had a longer barrel, though, too. Yes, you cut the barrel off, uh, lighten the stock up. Cut the barrel off, spray paint it camo. You know Put some it. duct tape on it. Yeah. Well, not back then. Um, <laughs> this rifle, it was not one of his favorites out of the out of the selection. He but it did fit the criteria. It fit the criteria. Right. Number three was the 30 carbine. Uh, uh, and, a, and this was an attempt to replace a pistol, basically. Yeah, I got to tell you, 30 carbines have never impressed me. Really? 
never. I, I used to think I wanted one, and then I started studying it, and I I just never have well wanted one. This this is listen to this. They were created because some soldiers could not hit anything with a handgun. So the military thought, well, instead of training them better, we'll just get them a rifle to replace their handgun. I think this is that's one theory. I think a, a very light, strong, and and the, again back to the thought, like the AR-15, having as many rounds as you on yeah. you as you possibly can. Thirty carbine rounds are fairly light. They're about the same weight. They're slightly more weight than a 223, but you could carry a lot of them on you. Well, and this is this is but from it 1966. Took a, it took year. a lot of those rounds, and these Cooper no. was had the experience. Cooper was in World War II in the islands. Yes, and he and had the experience with these guns. He said uh, there was nothing but negative long-range reports. Right. He said people would, some of the soldiers thought, well, we'll put scopes on it. They couldn't hit anything. There's no, there's no effective reason to put a scope on right. it. That's why scopes have never been popular on 30 carbines. No. Uh, it wasn't intended for long range at all. It's only 36 inches long, and it weighed five and a half pounds, basically. Yes. There's no recoil. Nope. It but is loud, though. His stance on the whole car this whole 30 carbine was that it's better than nothing at all yeah it would work in a pinch but as far as having it uh, i don't know 30 carbines never done nothing for me so i'm along the same lines of cooper okay what's next the fourth rifle he tested was the 44 ruger carbine and carbine and that that, that 44 carbine is a is a rifle that's near and dear to a lot of deer hunters right here in michigan he says it's a sophisticated 30 carbine it, it's simple yep. blowback operation. Better trigger, but the sights are not as good. Well, I don't know about that. I like the sights on them. See? Yeah, See? I like So it. we should do this our own. We should get these same six guns now and do an update of it. Well, we almost do anyway. Yeah. <laughs> we, now, I guess we could do our own report. His big complaint was that the tubular magazine is very clumsy and it requires three hands to load the gun. Eh, I think mean, he must have been fumble-fingered that day because I, I grew up shooting that gun and I learned it. 14 years old how to load that, load that gun. Not bad, I didn't no, think. It only It's 6 pounds, 1 ounce, yes. and only 37 inches long. And and if you want to hunt with that style gun with minimal recoil, it's a yep. great gun. Number 5 was the AR-15. Okay. At the time, neither Colt nor the Army would call it a carbine, uh, but it was still 39 inches long and weighed less than 7 pounds. It was conceived as a means of obtaining something for nothing, and in this case... What they wanted was killing power without recoil. The recoil of the M14s oh. and the and the M1 Grands was <coughs> tremendous compared to the minimal, if not no recoil, of the AR-15 style yeah. rifle. Yeah, some people so, are still afraid to shoot rifles, but you explain that an AR-15 has virtually no recoil. Uh, it's hard for some people to, to to gather, and then when you show them the size of the shell. They go, that's not what an AR-15 should right. Yes, it is. Now, at short range, this is these are all directly from his 1966 article here. Okay. At short range, it has man-stopping properties, even with a hard, solid spitzer bullet. At any great distance, though, after its velocity has dropped off, it naturally becomes just another twenty two. <laughs> well. Now, the Pentagon feels this is... I'm, this is not me saying this. This is Colonel Cooper saying this. The Pentagon feels that our people can't hit anything at those ranges anyways. You say can or can't? Can't. Okay. Can't hit anything at those ranges anyways, so who cares? And, of course, it doesn't kick. Now, the complaints were it was an astronomically high-priced gun in 1966. Complaint taken. With a, If you were to buy one of these off the shelf yes. with a couple magazines, it would run you $200. There you go. At the time. <laughs> At the time. Now, uh, before we get into the last gun he tested, he has a great, this is a very interesting, what he wrote, and I think it very rings true today. Personally, this e- if we could have a Cooperism for today, this would be it. Okay. Personally, this ease of use angle makes me a little uneasy. The British, heavily outnumbered in the Hundred Years' War, one by means of a weapon that was far from being easy to use. It was impossible for their enemies to use against them. The deadly, rapid-fire, armor-piercing longbow had to be learned from infancy. The French, Spanish, and Scots could not order up drafts of longbowmen where none existed. Ah. Now, 
So there was longbows against swordsmen. Right. So kill him from afar always makes more sense than kill him up close. But the secret was that the enemy did not know how to use the longbow. Right. So today, outnumbered as we are in a struggle that may well take another hundred years, and here we are 48 years later. Yeah. And still basically on the same continent. Uh, I don't like to see us counting on weapons that are easy to use. These weapons are easy for the enemy to use also. And there are many more of them than us. Wouldn't it be comforting if our people were equipped with weapons of such violent power that only the biggest, toughest, best t- trained troops in the world could use them? Hmm. End, end quote. The Barrett 50. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 40,000 men walking across the desert holding Barrett 50s. Yeah, I don't sure. know. I, you know, Ronnie Barrett would be happy about that one. Now, the last gun that Cooper tested on was what he called a truly astonishing little gun and one that is a breakthrough in modern sporting arms. You want to talk about it after the break? We're going to have to talk about it after the break. All right, let's go to commercial break. Uh, this is the Gunsmith Show on Saturday, October 11th. So hang on tight. We'll be right back. Home to feel sound when you are not around. Call Pal Alarm. To protect your safe keepings and stop anyone from peeking, call Pal Alarm. When the house gets locked down so you can get out of town, Call Pal Alarm. Give Pal Alarm a call today at 810-908-8298. That's 810-908-8298 or palalarm.com. Attorney Timothy J. Cassidy is the pro-gun attorney that we here at the Gunsmith Show use. With more than 20 years of experience as a prosecuting attorney, law professor, and holding a past seat on the Genesee County Gun Board, Tim Cassidy is your pro-gun attorney. Contact Attorney Cassidy today at 810-569-5441 or email him at attorneycassidy at gmail.com. The world-famous machine shop in Flint talks about DuraGuard Commercial Roofing. Hey, banana listeners. You know when the great people at DuraGuard Commercial Roofing in Grand Blank asked for my help? I said, of course. DuraGuard Roofing has done work for me, and I was without a doubt completely satisfied from the free estimate and inspection they offered all the way to the excellent job they did on my roof. So take it from me, DuraGuard Roofing rocks. Locally owned and operated, DuraGuard Commercial Roofing of Grand Blank has been providing quality roofing in Michigan for over 20 years. Complete with manufacturer's warranties and a vast knowledge on all roofing systems, as well as master contractors for Mulehide and Ginflex roofing systems. So when it comes to your business or home, trust the DuraGuard Commercial Roofing of Grand Blank. Call them, 810-955-8459. That's 810-955-8459. And remember what the machine shop has to say about DuraGuard. DuraGuard Roofing Rocks. And now, back to the Gunsmith Show with John and Jake Smith. If you'd like to talk to John or Jake, call now, 810-743-8255. All right, we are back. That's and, right. Uh, again, thanks to our sponsors. Well, like I say, we wouldn't be here without them. Now, Jake, we're talking about the sixth gun of Colonel Cooper's list of carbines from 1966. Carbines. 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 I'm going to have a hard time with that one. I know. But anyways. That's a combine. It's not a combine. Yeah, there you go. So it's a carbine. All right, so the last gun, uh, Colonel Jeff Cooper called it a truly astonishing little gun and one that is a breakthrough in a modern sporting arm. We're talking about the Remington Model 600 and 308 Winchester. Short action. Yes. Bold action. Dog leg bolt. Beautiful little gun and still one of the most highly sought after bold action rifles on the market. That's right. Uh, he actually considered it the most deadly weapon he had tested out of all six of these guns. I believe that. Lighter and smaller than all the other rifles except for the thirty carbine, which there's not much. Hard to compare. Hard to compare at Same all. Same size diameter bullet, much different power and range. It maintained that two-minute accuracy, so it kept two-inch groups at 200 yards with iron sights. So it had two-minute accuracy. It had a he called it near perfect trigger pull and the 19 inch barrel it's they're great guns i'm i'm all for it on this one now the 308 out of this rifle uh it actually matched the original 30 out six ballistics that were used in africa by teddy roosevelt yeah so he was a he was very vocal about that Cooper he liked was the 308 he because liked it a lot. of its power 
what right. it had. Now, in 1966, it was classified as actually a utility gun, yeah. much like you would buy maybe an American rifle today. Kind of like a ranch rifle. Yeah, you know? yeah exactly. It's just a ranch rifle. It's a, it's a short, handy gun you can keep in the back window of the truck, Yep. but you got enough knockdown power for coyotes or deer or now just about anything you want. 1966, they sold for $100. Really? Yes. Isn't that something? These had these came a box of shells and was three dollars and fifty three cents at the Western Western, Western Auto, Auto Parts. Store. <laughs> yeah. Now uh, the Model Six Hundreds then they were actually only made for uh, from nineteen sixty four to nineteen sixty seven. Jeez, three years. Fifty four thousand of them made. What a difference they made in the in the gun world. Absolutely, uh, but th- that's actually I th- we've talked about it before, and they are actually the XP one hundred enlarged that's where they took the handgun and made it into a rifle okay but uh these were the ones that originally had that full length plastic rib yes yeah, ventilated very rib. futuristic looking gun great i you know what I, I fell in love with them when i first saw them as a kid and i wanted one and it took me 25 years 30 years to get one uh and then you sold it well i didn't i i got the one i wanted i got the six millimeter remington very powerful gun uh more powerful than a 243 and uh, but I really wanted a 308 or the 350 Remington Magnum. Well, I have a model 600 Mo- Mohawk. Yes, which is it doesn't have the plastic rib. That's okay though. Uh, but what Cooper did was he took the rib off. He says we don't need that. He right. put a. This is when he put the forward mounted loop pulled scope on it. So this is a forward mounted scope with a long eye relief. Correct. So that you can look down the barrel and see the scope three quarters of the way down the barrel or two thirds of the way down the barrel. Yep. Uh, very he, smart. He claimed that with the 600 and 308. It makes it easier to load and unload as well. Absolutely. Uh, he could kill an elk, moose, or even a lion with one shot. Well, yeah. I'm, so. I imagine you could. Now, that was in 1966. Yes. If we jump forward to 1990, this is where our gun of the week comes in at. Okay. The president of IPSIC at the time, his name was Jean-Pierre Denis. Denise? Probably Denise. Denise? Jean-Pierre Denise. Jean-Pierre Denise. Denise. He met with Jeff Cooper. Yes. And they, hit, they... They hit it off. They hit it off. This is in September of 1990. They went to the Steyr factory in Austria. Ah. They heard Steyr was building a new safe action, bolt action rifle. It had safeties. It was a very smart rifle. Uh, and they introduced the president of Steyr to the St- scout rifle concept. Okay. They liked it. In 1990, who, in December... Who wouldn't? Right. <laughs> in December of 90, the president of Steyr spent a week and a half at the Gunsight Ranch with Cooper, Cooper yep. and went over all the scout rifles and, and started really saying, hey, this is possible, we need to do this. So on his flight back to his Austrian plant... Uh, he actually began to sketch images of what the Steyr Scout Rifle can look like of what it, and how it should work and mm-hmm. what it needs to have. Uh, we're posting those pictures on in just a little bit here on our Facebook page. All right. Uh, and in 1991, really the first concepts came out. Lightweight aluminum receiver, integral weaver rail on the whole length of the gun on the top. Really? Just, just something that had never been seen before. Right. Now, once the design were done... In 1993, it was sent to the engineers at Steyr, and they began producing it. So it took them from 1993 until 1996 to have the working models presented to Cooper, and he actually performed the testing at Gunsight Ranch. Very How good. cool is that? It's, it's, it'd be nice to see your design, your thoughts, your design concepts come to fruition with a gun that it hit the market strong. I mean, it was the it was a Cooper's design Steyr Scout rifle. Absolutely, and very very uh, good looking gun. Now, so from June of ninety six until September twenty fourth, nineteen ninety seven. Yeah, that is when this rifle was presented at the NRA Whittington Center in New Mexico. Yes, it's brought out in what they called the Scout Conference, and it must have been just a, a large. Bunch of Cub Scouts? Convergence of, of <laughs> shooters. And I can imagine at the time the types of Cooper, Boddington, yeah. uh, all these other people that have written about guns had come yeah. there to Mike, talk about Mike Scout Mike Rifle. Venturino exactly. and all the guys, yeah. I don't know if Pat Sweeney was there. Pat, if you were there, I know you're listening this morning. Uh, if you were there, let us know if you, what you thought of it. Absolutely. 
Uh, it, it, so that's 1997, September 24th. Good. Now, January of 1998, Chat Show, Las Jump Vegas. Ahead. Jumping ahead a couple months. <laughs> the first general public showing of this rifle was presented at the Shot Show. Yes. With the notifications that these will be shipping in May of 1998. So in January, they were shown to the public, shipping in May. Now, Jeff Cooper was presented the first fully furnished rifle, completely just completely customized for him, exactly what he wanted. But the interesting thing was, what he wanted became their Jeff Cooper model, and it was available to buy. Oh, With everything cool. from the forward-mounted scope to the custom stock, everything, it was the, the, Cooper, the Cooper rifle, but from Steyr. Now, since then... Yes. There's been other people trying to copy that rifle here in America. There has. Uh, Savage currently has the availability for a scout rifle. And, of course, Ruger exactly. has the gun sight rifle. And uh, I don't know weight-wise no. how they did weight-wise compared to what Cooper wanted. I looked at, I, I checked on this because I, I personally don't feel the new two twenty three gun sight rifle matches it's it's, too, it's heavier than seven pounds. Why does a two twenty three bolt action have to weigh more than seven pounds? Well, skip the two twenty three. I'm not happy that Ruger come out with a two twenty three bolt. But action. if we go back to the three hundred eight, yes, it's less than seven pounds. It fits into the right lengths. It holds twenty rounds instead of five. Has, it has a box magazine. Exactly. So you open can sights and the availability for forward mounted scope break. Right. So right. I would consider the Ruger gun sight rifle in three hundred eight only a more economical choice compared to the Steyr. Well, what I'm waiting to see is Ruger, because sometimes there is a need for a more powerful round. Right. I'd like to see, like, just like what Steyr offered with the 376 Steyr, exactly. a more powerful round uh, for big game hunting, I'd like to see Ruger put the gun sight rifle, rather than in 223. I'd like to see him do the Ruger Compact Magnum in a higher caliber, in the 338 Ruger Compact Magnum, and don't they have a bigger one? I believe I they I think do. they did a 375 Ruger Compact no, Magnum? No, no, they had a 300 and a 338 Ruger Compact. Okay, well, I'd like but to see something. But there's no reason why they could not put a 375 caliber bullet through the gun sight rifle. Right. And Which, that, this is why... That's what makes sense to me. Why not make a gun that can go to Africa and do the hunting there? That's the thing. Steyr offered these rifles in 308, 243, 223... 7 millimeter 08, 7.5 Swiss, and that 376 Steyr. The reason they did that 376 Steyr was because Africa, for many of your big game hunts, your your caliber must be larger than 0.375. Right. Or 0.375 or larger. Right. So that takes the 35 Whalen out, takes out the 30 odd 6, the 308. So a, a larger caliber rifle must be needed because Remember, they feel that's what's needed to penetrate thick-gamed animals. Even back to Ghost in the Darkness and all the stories about... Uh, James Patterson and the Lions right. in in uh, in West Africa. That was done with a three hundred three British. Exactly. So the, the, the guns will do it, but they've set standards so that underpowered rifles aren't used. Right. So that makes a lot of sense. But I, I would like to see Ruger step it up and, and reproduce that gun. Uh, and and keep it as light as they can. You know, I like the gun sight rifle. It really caught my eye. Uh, didn't we even give one away in a raffle? We did. We did. We gave it one three hundred eight uh, bolt action away in a raffle. It's a, it's a great rifle. Uh, but that Steyr, what it also has is that front stock folds down into a bipod. Yes, it does. Which is just, I think, an amazing feature that I wish more guns had. I, it's a, it was all built right into the into the forend. Exactly. Folded right down so she had a sturdy bipod built right into the gun. To make it light, they hollowed out the rear butt stock. Yes. And two magazines can fit into it. That's the right. It, so, was, it was like a, a survival tool. Exactly. Right now, the Steyrs are going anywhere from 1400 to 2400 depending on the models. And that's on some of the gun auction sites. Good. Uh, if you can find one in a store new, oh, that's yeah. awesome. Never see them. Never, just never but, see them. But that's this neck of the woods, you know? That's right. Well, you know what, though? It's that time of the show already. Yeah, we got, we got Mike Gaylord coming in here in just a minute with everything classic, so uh, hang on tight for that. But this has been the Gunsmith Show on Saturday, November or October 11th. Thank you very much. I was thinking about Veterans I Day hope coming up. you enjoyed our talk about the carbine. And you know what, though? 
Make, tell all your friends. It's not a carbine. It's a carbine. Carbine. Correct them around the coffee table. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> That'll make your friends like even more. <laughs> well, I'm is glad that, you Is that your secret, Dad? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's what it is. I'm, uh, I'm glad you spent some time with us today with us here on the Gunsmith Show. Again, you get out to William's Gun Site, tell them the Gunsmith Show sent you. And we got to get out of here for now. So I'm John. And I'm Jake. Have a great weekend. Shoot straight, folks. Talk to you soon.